Give God a hand clap of praise. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. We invite you to come. At this time, if you're here, we invite you to come to the altar. Come believing. Come on, Brother Carlton. Come believing. Come ready to receive that which God has in store for you at this time. Won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? Most gracious God, our Father, O oh Lord, how great Thou art. O oh, Heavenly Father, every day I recognize what a mighty God we serve. How you watch over us each and every night. You wake us up each and every day, O oh, Heavenly Father. You give us strength to go on through each and every day. Heavenly Father, we breathe and think not, we see and recognize. Heavenly Father, the heart pumps and we do not tell it to, but still it does what it's supposed to do. The brain thinks, the brain reacts and keeps us able to process throughout each and every day. How mighty, how wonderful is the work that thou have created. Heavenly Father, we cannot even fathom the depths of even the human body, O oh Lord. Your hand is so masterful, so wonderful to have created such a one as us. Heavenly Father, all we can say is thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you that when we got up this morning, O oh Lord, we had food on our tables. Heavenly Father, we thank you when uh, we got up this morning, we had our uh, strength to get out of bed. We thank you, O oh Lord, when we got up this morning, we was able to get dressed and able to come through these doors of Zion Baptist Church once more. Heavenly Father, it was not our power, it was your power, O oh Heavenly Father, that made it possible for us to make it here safely. For you watched out for us, O oh Lord, on our way. And you kept our journey safe, O oh Heavenly Father, and kept us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And we just say thank you. Thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for Zion Baptist Church. We thank you for this congregation, O oh Lord. We thank you for our pastor, who is still on the post who is still preaching the uncompromising gospel and still holding up the blood-stained banner. Heavenly Father, continue to bless him, O oh Lord, in a mighty way as he continues to lead your people. Heavenly Father, and each and every member of this congregation, look upon us, Lord, because we all stand in the need of prayer. Heavenly Father, some things are spoken and some things are unspoken. But we all need you right now in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we go through, we know not each and every day. But you know what's coming, oh Heavenly Father, and you can prepare us. So continue to order our steps, oh Heavenly Father, that we will walk the walk we need to walk. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are sick among us, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Let healing power come their way, O oh Heavenly Father. Let them get strength, O oh Heavenly Father. Let them get power from on high to be able to heal whatever is bothering them. And for those, O oh Heavenly Father, who have lost loved ones in the name of Jesus, give them comfort and peace, O oh Lord. For even though we know 
The death is not an end. The pain still comes and the hurt still comes, oh Heavenly Father. But we know you have said weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So help us to hang on, Lord, while our joy comes. And as we go about each and every day, oh Heavenly Father, let us hold on to that joy, knowing that the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. But Lord, let us always have hope and have joy in you, for you are the one, the author and finisher of our faith. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who've lost loved ones in the school shooting, oh Heavenly Father, in Florida. Heavenly Father, we know uh, evil is present all over the land, but we want comfort to come unto those families, oh Heavenly Father. Strength, oh Lord, and, and, and if possible, a recognition by the shooter that what he did was evil, was not of you. And help him maybe by your spirit, by your grace, he can change and turn from his wicked ways. Heavenly Father, sometimes, oh Lord, road gets rough. Sometimes, oh Heavenly Father, when we go about our daily lives, people get in our way. And we mess up, Lord. We say things, we do things we know we shouldn't have done. We sin, Lord. But right now we ask for forgiveness of our sins and strength to go on in the right way. Help us to turn from temptation and to walk the straight path. Because right now we need you, oh Lord. Trouble is all around. But we know a God who is able, who is able to let grace and mercy come in and fix things the way they should be. So right now we call on grace and mercy to come in and help us. Fix us, oh Heavenly Father, touch us, oh Lord, so that what we do can be right in your sight until that day when you come again and call us home. We pray so that you can say unto us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Amen.
through storm clouds.
helped me appreciate this choir. Come on, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. They're looking mighty resplendent this morning. Would you also help me appreciate our band? Amen. Amen. We are grateful. Grateful. Brother Debo, bless you for that horn. Brother Casey, see if I knew you better, I'd give a line from KC in the Sunshine Band. Play that gospel music, boy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, thank you so much for blessing us. They continue to show us repeatedly that we're all different and that we all have our own respective unique gifts. From the sopranos, to the altos, to the tenors. Do we have a bass in the group? Bro War, bicep, holding up the bloodstained banner. Brother Williams? No, Larry's in between, he's not sure. <laughs> But they continue to show us, my brothers and sisters, the diversity of gifts. Amen. Who could blow the horn like Rick Debo? Who can play the guitar? The lead guitar like Brother Casey. Amen. So we're just thankful to have them. To bless us in their own respective way. And we continue to pray that God continues to pour out his manifold blessings upon each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. If we're grateful unto God, let's give God a hand clap of praise at this time. We're so grateful. Well, saints of God, it is preaching time. But before I preach, I would request of you that you have a moment of silence with me for the families who have suffered terrible losses as a result of the massacre of their loved ones from the mass shooting experienced in a high school in Florida. Oh, my brothers and sisters, how much more do we need to suffer? How many more families need to experience a tragedy before our cowardly congressmen and congresswomen will vote for more stringent gun control of semi-automatic assault weapons? How much longer will they, our congressional representatives be pimped by the NRA and the millions of dollars that the gun lobbyists put into their political coffers. How much longer will they, our congressional representatives, be allowed to vote against the wishes of their constituency? How much longer before we kick all of them out of office? You do know that statistically most civil-minded Americans want more stringent federal background checks and psychological evaluations for potential gun purchasers. And that the United States leads in mass shootings and mass slaughters over and above any other industrialized country in the world today. You do know that. My brothers and sisters, we can change things if we vote our conscience and not our political party. So let us pray. Dear God, we come now in humble submission to your holy and divine throne. And Lord God, we just ask that you be with the families 
of all of the innocent children and the adults that died protecting children in Florida. Lord God, this world has gone crazy. But we know that you still hold the reins. So Lord, we just ask now in a special way, minister to the hearts of the loved ones that are left behind. Minister to those that are still in the hospitals fighting for their respective lives. And then Lord, be a burden upon all of our congressional representatives who will not stand for what is right. Change their minds. Cleanse their hearts. Let them not be slaves to filthy lucre, but let them be slaves unto your word and your will. For it's in the blessed name of our darling son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray and ask. And the saints of God said, Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you're physically able, would you please stand with us for the reading of our scriptural reference for this morning? It's taken from the book of Genesis, again, the 37th chapter, verses 26 through 28. Genesis, 37th chapter, verses 26 through 28. It's prepared for you on our television monitors. Let's read that together, shall we? Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by. So they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. From this text, I want to speak on the subject of Uniquely Us and Slavery, Part 2. Uniquely Us and Slavery, Part 2. My brothers and sisters, as your exegetical escort, I could briefly sum up the scripture by suggesting that due to Joseph's brother's ignorance of his special calling and his special purpose by God and their jealousy of his respective stature with their father and their economically depraved lust for filthy lucre, they devised a machination or scheme to sell their brother off into slavery. Not recognizing that what they meant for evil, amen, God meant for good. You find that in Genesis 50 verses 15 through 20. You see church, evil men. Amen? Always think myopically because they are nearsighted. They're only in it and only interested in what's in it for them. Much like our current president, number 45. But you see, God sent men and God ordained men. Think macrocosmically they see the macro they see the big picture and are interested in how their decisions or actions impact everyone regardless of their race regardless of their religion regardless of their creed like our former president president barack obama amen I didn't necessarily agree with all of his thoughts or all of his actions, but praise God, we had a man in the office that was full of integrity. And we don't have, even to this date, one rumor or one bad thing that follows him after he left the presidency. But my God, since day one,
Has there been a day without some type of controversy? Let me go on and preach this text. Saints, for the past two weeks, I've shared with you that my underlying premise, my central theme, my main point was this. It's my contention, Reverend Gerald J. Jones, it's my contention that one of the reasons we African Americans as a people were experiencing so much violence in our communities, such as pernicious black-on-black -black crime, robbing one another, and perpetuating senseless murders among ourselves, was because we had forgotten from whence we have come. Thus, proffering the premise that having a knowledge of our past should preclude us from making some of the same mistakes that we made in our past. And hopefully that same knowledge, that knowledge of our past, would illuminate or enlighten our minds so that we choose a different and a more productive path for us to take in the future. Do I have a witness? A path less strewn, uh, strewn with painful potholes and pitfalls. I also proffered the hypothesis that economics played a pivotal role in our experiencing some of our past and present maladies. My brothers and sisters, it's insane for us to continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. If God has illuminated our minds, if God has laid out for us that this behavior, this course of action, this path will only end up in your ruin, then logic would tell us to choose another way. Amen? Well, my brothers and sisters, I shared with us that while I don't believe that God caused us to experience these travesties, I do believe that he allowed us to experience those trials and tribulations because he knew of our ability to persevere. He knew of our ability to remain faithful during difficult and trying times. He designed us to withstand persecution and gave us an uncanny hope for the future. God placed us or in us a healthy discontent for the status quo and knew that we as a people would strive against injustice for we as a people believe that injustice tolerated anywhere is an affront to justice everywhere. That was my belief. That's what I shared with you. And I agree and understand that others might disagree with me, and that's okay. We can agree to disagree. We just can't be disagreeable. Amen? But this is what I believe, saints, and this is what I stand on. Well, this week, I want to continue on in that vein and further my expostulation as to why God allowed us, we African Americans, we unique people, to experience the ravages of slavery at the hands of evil and supposedly Christian men. Today, I want to deal a little bit more with the historicity of slavery and the psychology of slavery. Amen? As I deal with the historicity of slavery, I would have you know that in the late 18th century, with the land used to grow tobacco nearly exhausted, the South faced an economic crisis, and the continued growth of slavery in America seemed in doubt. Around the same time, though, the mechanization of textile industry in England led to a huge demand for American cotton, a southern crop whose production was unfortunately limited by the difficulty of removing the seeds from the raw cotton fibers by hand. Anybody in here ever pick cotton? 
It is a tallest, burdensome, back-breaking, finger-ripping job. Amen. Billy's not here, but I know Billy's family, Pick Cotton, and Billy could share with me how painful of a process that was. Amen. You see, my brothers and sisters, the slave industry almost toppled. But because of England needing American cotton, then the industry experienced a boom. In 1793, a young Yankee school teacher named Eli Whitney invited the cotton gin, and within a few years, the South would transition from the large-scale production of tobacco to that of cotton, a switch that reinforced the region's dependence on slave slave labor. Though the U.S. Congress outlawed the African slave trade in 1808, I'm going somewhere, I'm teaching this morning, the domestic trade flourished and the slave population in the United States nearly tripled over the next 50 years. By 1860, it had reached nearly 4 million African American slaves with more than half living in the cotton-producing states of the South. Slaves in the antebellum South constituted about one-third of the Southern population. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying one out of every three people that lived in the South was black. But yet, they were enslaved. Most slaves lived on large plantations or small farms. Many masters owned fewer than 50 slaves. Slave owners sought to make their slaves completely dependent on them, so they developed a system of restrictive codes to govern the lives of their slaves. What kind of codes? Codes like this, my brothers and sisters. Slaves were prohibited from learning to read and to write because the white man knew that education would be the key for them to overcome their slavery. So they did not want them to read nor write. Number two, slave behavior and movement was restricted. So therefore they put overseers over them to watch everywhere they went and everything they did. Number three, slaves were never allowed to have arms and ammunition. Number four, a child's status depended on the mother's status. So if the mother was a slave, then therefore the child was a slave. Baptism did not alter the condition of the slave regarding his or her bondage or his or her freedom. So I don't care if the Quakers came through and baptized the slaves and then identified them as Christians. Slave code said that if you were born a non-Christian, you were born a slave and you would continue to be a slave. All slaves who were not Christian at the time of their purchase would not be considered as Christians simply because they were purchased by some Christian. Number seven, all servants imported and brought into this country who are not considered as Christians in their native country would not be considered as Christians here and would be considered as slaves in this country. Many masters took sexual liberties with slave women and rewarded obedient slave behavior with favors while rebellious slaves were brutally punished. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, brothers... You could be laying in bed with your wives and your children around you and a slave master could come into your house at night, put you out of bed, lay in bed with your wife, have sex with your wife and impregnate her in front of you and your children and it was nothing you could do about it. A strict hierarchy among slaves, from privileged house slaves and skilled artisans down to the lowly field hands, helped keep them divided and less likely to organize against their masters. What are you saying? I'm saying that even then, my brothers and sisters, the slave owners knew that the, da knew the danger of the motto, united we stand and divided we fall. So they did everything to keep us divided. Amen. Mulattoes against dark-skinned black people. Mandingos 
against Eurobus. They kept us separated so that we would not be able to communicate in the same language, so that we wouldn't be able to strategize, so that we wouldn't be able to plan to overcome. United we stood, but divided we fell. Slave marriages had no legal basis, but slaves did marry and raise large families. Most slave owners encouraged this practice because it produced more field hands. But nonetheless, it didn't hesitate. they didn't hesitate from dividing these families and selling the children off into slavery. So one could question, how could a people who came from proud kingdoms and African nations allow themselves to suffer such injustices? Why didn't they just join together and rebel or cause insurrections, insurrections against their slave masters? I'm glad you asked me. In order to understand the answer to that question, you have to understand the psychology of slavery. We've talked about the historicity. Now let's talk about the psychology. You see, my brothers and sisters, I'd, I'd like to answer that question by sharing with you an excerpt from pages 16 and 17 of Velma Maya Thomas's book, Lest We Forget. Ms. Thomas writes, how does one become a slave? What is the process that turns a human being into a creature of self-hatred and self-doubt? Someone fully controlled and in fear for all of another human being. Slave hunt, uh, slaveholders developed a system. It was called seasoning. It was the process under which strong men and strong women were broken, stripped of their dignity and tortured. Seasoning was a brutal system, a system that remade men in an image pleasing to their oppressor, but not pleasing unto God. It rewarded good behavior and punished bad behavior. It turned captive men into things and their captors into beasts. The wise slave master never took seriously the belief that our people were natural born slaves. He knew that African men and women fresh from the continent had to be broken in. Lord have mercy. They had to be forced to accept a subservient position. Slaves could never be trusted fully because men wanted to be free. And if slavery were to work, if strong men in succeeding generations were to wear the yoke of bondage, their psychology would have to be altered they would have to be made to believe that they were innately inferior and accept, and accept slavery as their natural condition. The seasoning process was neither quick nor easy. It took months, years, generations to break our people's spirit. Slaveholders knew the process was essential. Without it, the slaveholding regime would fall. The seasoning began shortly after the arrival of a new shipload of enslaved Africans. Most planners selected trusted slaves, though who had, those who had already been successfully conditioned to train the new arrivals. Seasoned slaves taught the new slaves the rudiments of plantation life and how to survive in the cruel new world. They taught them how to communicate, how to use tools, how to greet white men with lowered eyes. They taught them their new names and made sure they understood the new culture and its values. They soothed new arrivals and shielded them the best they could from violent overseers and tried to explain how they would never again in life be free. Never again return to the country of their birth. They convinced the novices that compliance was in their best interest, that rebellion would result in death. New arrivals were not the only ones to undergo this condition. Each genera generation underwent a series of psychological and physical torture to make them stand in fear. The plantation was a closed system, my brothers and sisters. The overseer and the master, the ultimate authority. Do you not know that if a slave denied this, the overseer could withhold food from that slave? If the slave fought back, the slaveholder could sell the slave or the loved ones from that slave right in front of him. For refusing an order, the rebellious slave could be hung by the thumbs. 
naked, beaten with a paddle, and then left to blister in the burning sun. Our people were whipped for leaving their plantation without a pass. They were shut up in nigger boxes for running away. They were hung for lying or stealing. They were castrated if accused for violating a white woman. They were mutilated and chained if they killed a white man, even if it was in self-defense. Slaves were branded. They were burned. They were choked. They were bound. They were covered with molasses to attract biting insects. And then they were decapitated. Their heads were stuck on posts along well-traveled routes. Such acts were done to reinforce the slaveholders' claim of being all-powerful, to convince our people to submit and to force them to accept his code of ethics and conduct. It is difficult to express in words the horrors that our foreparents endured during this seasoning process. Some of our Western European brothers and sisters argue the tales of brutality are exaggerated. They argue that most slaveholders treated their slaves kindly, reverting to the whip and brute force only when necessary. But slave narratives, slave letters tell a different story. Even if the individuals were spared the whip, they heard about or saw others who received it unmercifully, or they themselves were punished in other ways. No man, stated former slave Austin Stewart, could possibly escape being punished, care not how attentive he might have been or how industrious he was, he would end up punished. Such was the law of the plantation. Such was the making of a slave. So now that you know a little bit more about your history, now that you know how the oppressive slave owners used psychological mind control and terrorist bar barbarism to conduct and subdue our former parents, what are you going to do about it? Why am I making this plain to us today? Why am I sharing the history of our people with us today? I told you earlier that if you don't know from whence you've come, then you don't know where you're going. Our slaveholders of yesterday have changed their methodology. Today versus having plantations that they take us to, the plantations are right inside our own communities. The slave owners versus being of a different hue are our own brothers and sisters who are heading up the gangs, heading up the drug trade. Black people don't make the drugs. Black people don't bring the drugs into the country. Black people don't make weapons. Black people don't bring weapons in the country. But what the slave masters do is they tell some of our overseers, they tell some of our own house niggers that they can represent the powers that be and that if you enslave your brothers and sisters by pouring dope into their arms, if you enslave your brothers and sisters by making them become members of a gang, what we'll do is slide you a little money. We'll pay you the money so that you can live where you want to live. You can dress like you want to dress. You can drive what you want to drive. But keep all the little pickaninnies under your control so that we're not viewed as the slave owners anymore. You represent us. And we as a people, because we did not know our history, have fallen prey to the same slave mentality that we had back in the 1860s. Where are our youth? Because we won't stand up like our foreparents. Our youths are falling prey to gang leaders who tell them your mama don't care about you. Your father doesn't care about you. So come on into our gang. Wear our colors. We'll represent you. We'll protect you. 
We'll feed you when you're hungry. We'll put clothes on your back when you're naked. We'll give you water when you're thirsty. Churches are dying. Members are leaving because we won't stand up and take care of our communities. But gang members are saying, come to us. All we say is give your allegiance to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. And he'll make it better. He'll fight your battles. But what do they say? Give your life to us and prove your worthiness to us. How do you prove your worthiness to us? You got to go out and kill somebody. And once you kill somebody on our behalf, then we'll protect you. We'll feed you. We'll clothe you. You'll never be without family. And we as a church have failed because we have let the voice of the adversary ring louder than the voice of the church. I know what you're thinking. Maybe you are sitting here today and you're saying, Reverend, I, I wouldn't have tolerated slavery. I wouldn't do it today. And I wouldn't have done it back then. Wouldn't nobody beat me. Wouldn't nobody throw me in a nigger box. Wouldn't nobody castrate me? Wouldn't nobody lay next to my woman with me watching and have sex with my woman? I wouldn't have tolerated it. I would have led in a revolt. I would have killed every person that I could get my hands on. Well, you would have thought that. You would have revolted. Yeah, guess what? There were many others who felt the same way you do. They felt it back then. They rebelled. They revolted. And they died. Brutal deaths. <coughs> the New York Revolt in 17 and 12. Nine whites were shot, stabbed, or beaten to death, and six were injured. As a result of this failed revolt, 70 blacks were put in jail, six committed suicide, 27 were put on trial, of which 21 were burned to death publicly. Not enough? The Steno Rebellion in 1739. Jimmy, an Angolan slave, and 20 African slaves seized weapons and ammunition at the Stono, uh, Stono River Bridge. They burned seven plantations and killed 20 whites. They recruited more slaves and grew their numbers up to 80. However, they were suppressed by a mob of plantation owners under the command of Governor William Bull. The captured slaves were decapitated and their heads were spiked along the road for all other slaves to see as they traversed the roads of the plantation. Not enough? Louisiana Territory Slave Rebellion in 1811. Charles Desalandes led 500 slaves down the Mississippi River Road and along the way killed two whites and burned plantations. A militia and U.S. troops confronted the rebellion. Sixty-six slaves were killed in the fight and Desalandes with 22 slaves were captured. They were decapitated and their heads were stacked along the river. This rebellion is considered the largest slave rebellion in the United States of America. I'm telling you about your history. Not enough. Nat Turner, his rebellion in 1831. Turner and 70 enslaved and freed blacks went from house to house freeing slaves and killing whites. They used knives and hatchets and axes in order to keep their rebellion quiet. Turner and his rebellion were defeated by a militia. Overall, Turner's rebellion killed 55 white men, women, and children in a two-day period. However, Turner's body was mutilated, severed, and sent to different parts of Southampton County, Virginia to serve as a deterrent to other slaves who might have been considering rebellion. Not enough, Harper's Ferry, 1859. John Brown led a raid on a federal armor at Harper's Ferry. 
He wanted to arm slaves. However, the raid failed as Brown's men either fled or were killed by the local militia. Brown himself was captured and he was hung for treason. My brothers and sisters, violence doesn't do anything but beget violence. That's the reason Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in 1961, violence brings only temporary victories. Violence, by creating many more social problems than it solves, never brings permanent peace. I am convinced that if we succumb to the temptation of violence in our struggle for freedom, Unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and our chief legacy to them will be a never-ending reign of chaos. And two years later, he said in 1963, if we are arrested every day, if we are exploited every day, if we are trampled over every day, don't ever let anyone pull you so low as to hate them. We must use the weapon of love. We must have compassion and understanding for those who hate us. We must realize so many people are taught to hate us that they are not totally responsible for their hate. But we stand in life at midnight. We are always on the threshold of a new dawn. My brothers and sisters, our love for God and his righteousness helped us to overcome slavery in the past and that same love will aid us in overcoming our current dilemma of self-hate and deprivation. My brothers and sisters, as we look at our text today, as I come to a close, you see, because of their jealousy and their hatred, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery and once he went into slavery it wasn't an easy road as he was a slave the difference between his slavery and our slavery his slavery was slavery as an indentured servant he was treated as part of Potiphar's household so much so that he raised in the ranks to whereas he had control over all of Potiphar's house. He had full run of the house. He was free to operate second in command of Potiphar. And he was a fine young man. Because he was fine, because he was attractive, Potiphar's wife fell for him. She wanted to do more than just touch his coat of many colors. So as she reached out to grab him and to demand that he had sexual relationships with her, because of his faithfulness and because of his love for his God, he ran and left his coat behind. And then she used his coat to lie on him. So much so that when Potiphar came home, he was enraged. The man he had trusted, the man he had given charge over his house, tried to rape his wife, so he put him in prison. My brothers and sisters, while he was in prison, he suffered unnameable atrocities, but yet he still had God's favor. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying just like when we were in slavery, just like when we were being abused, we had God's favor. It may not have felt like it, but God was always in the shadow. God was always lifting up leaders. God was always protecting us. While he was in prison, God provided him an opportunity. He sent a baker The baker and the butler had dreams. And when they revealed their dreams to Joseph, Joseph interpreted their dreams. God blessed him and gave him the ability to interpret their dreams. So he interpreted it, gave some good news, Brother Mark, and gave some bad news. One of them, because of his dream, his head would be lifted up and he would go back into the good favor of Pharaoh and be able to serve again. But the other, because of his dream, he would be beheaded and he would die. The one got lifted up, but he forgot about Joseph. 
But a time came when Pharaoh himself had a dream. And then he remembered Joseph. And when Joseph went to him and told Pharaoh what was going to happen, let me abbreviate this. Joseph told him what was going to happen. So again, he experienced God's favor. And Joseph was raised up out of the prison and was placed second in command under the Pharaoh. So much so that when the famine came, those same brothers who sold him into slavery were sent to Egypt to buy grain from Pharaoh. But versus having an audience with Pharaoh, they had to meet with Pharaoh second in command. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, if we remain faithful under God, if we continue to lean on God's unchanging hand, if we continue to preach the word in season and out of season, if we continue to live righteous lives before our oppressors, before our enemies, God will lift us up. God will lift up the church of the true and living God, and we will reign supreme again. God's word doesn't return void. The brothers had to come to him. And without recognizing, he took them through some trials. But in the end, when they brought him his younger brother, Benjamin, my brothers and sisters, he couldn't take it anymore. He broke down and he cried and he shared with them who he was. And by that, he was able to reunite his family and reunite himself with his father. And because of that, they became the nation of Israel. My brothers and sisters, we are uniquely us. And although we've experienced slavery, although we had to do battle with the historicity of slavery and the psychology of slavery, we are here today because our foreparents stood the test of time and they overcame. What's our charge? What will we do? Will we continue to sit idly by and allow the unchecked violence to continue on in our communities? Or will we get down on our knees? Will we start praying righteous prayers? Will we start living holy lives? Will we start talking to our young men and our young women again and telling them that you come from a proud heritage and you don't have to act the way you act? Will we start opening up our churches and versus just condemning them, start doing job training programs? Will we start uh, having feeding programs for individuals whose parents can't feed them in the morning? What will we do? It's my prayer that we will recognize from whence we've come and how God helped us to overcome. And the same God that did it for us then will do it for us again. We will stand as a proud people of integrity in the face of adversity because we are uniquely us. The doors of this church are open, and we invite you to stand. We invite you to stand. If you're here today and you have not made the decision to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, we invite you to come and invite you to let him be Lord of your life. If you're here today, we invite you to come. As the choir leads us, in the hymn of invitation, we invite you to come. one today is there one today is there one today is there one today One today, is there one today? Not pass me by. 
anyone today in my sermon by the use of certain terminologies, especially in the ears of some of our young people, our children. I apologize to you parents, but I wanted to speak the truth. Whether you believe it or not, it's not the first time they've heard it. If they watch any television program with rap singers on it, they've heard everything I said today and even more. But I needed to teach. I needed all of us to understand the richness of our heritage. I needed all of us to understand just what our foreparents went through. Anybody seen Mudbound? If you got Netflix, watch Mudbound. It's a movie about sharecroppers in Mississippi. It's a movie that relives everything I just got through teaching you about. I haven't talked about Reconstruction yet. I'm still in slavery. You do know it was just 1963 when they passed the Civil Rights Law, right? This, this stuff you walking around, this stuff you walking around thinking you free? Just because nobody has a whip that's cracking you across your back? You're not free. You need to watch Mudbound and other movies dealing with the civil rights. Rosa Parks, we just watched that. You need to acquaint yourself with your history and then maybe that'll change your attitude about how you live today. Anybody been to see Black Panther yet? You need to go see Black Panther. It'll show you modern day how they twist our perception of ourselves. But within the same vein, it'll show you 
from whence we've come. Technology of Africa. Pride of Africa. I can't tell you the story because I'm going to let you go. <laughs> but the closing scene to me was almost, it was the best. Because when an African nation stood up before What's that organization they call all the nations come together? United Nations? United Nations? Huh? Oh, don't tell. <laughs> Y'all know I'm like an old refrigerator. <laughs> Will it hurt them if I just give them that one line? Yes. No. They, won't, they won't know from the one line. Yes, they will. Okay, they won't let me tell y'all. All I can say is, when you do hear that one line, it's a revelation. Because it just show you what the Western European mindset is of Africans and African nation. Amen? And when you hear that one line, you're going to say, all right, let's stand for the benediction. Dear God, our Father, we come to you again at this hour, and Lord, we just praise your holy name for all that our eyes have seen, all that our ears have heard, all that our hearts have experienced. Lord God, we're thankful for history. For Lord, we learn from history what mistakes not to make, but then to what direction to follow. So thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy, thank you for your long suffering, and thank you for your favor upon us. We are uniquely us, and we pray that you would continue. Stand by us, lead us, guide us, and provide us with your direction. Now may the grace of God, sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, and the love of his darling son, Jesus the Christ, rest, rule, and abide with these thy people, now henceforth and forevermore. May the redeemed of the Lord sing a threefold amen. Amen. I see Jesus. Jesus.